We, uh, unfortunately, we have 15 minute limits for our, our talks, so we won't be able to take questions. We'll have the opportunity after the session is over. Our next speaker is James Wilkerson, uh, who will be talking about landscapes, colonialism, and the possibility of knowing subjects. Hello, I'm very grateful that uh, Fred Damon uh, invited me to participate in this session. And uh, I apologize to the commentator for uh, my, the late, late arrival of my paper. There's supposed to be something I push. Uh, what did I want? Oh, I want Oh, there we go. <laughs> it's the big green button and you have to aim it that way. Which way? Down. Down, okay. Well, uh, landscape colonialism and the possibility of no, knowing subject. An example of the history of changing Austronesian and Hokkien Hakka, Han Chinese landscapes in Taiwan. Uh, my presentation has three parts. Uh, the first part is going to introduce the subject of the sub southern frontier, frontier of the Chinese empire and the archeological and linguistic prehistoric prehistory of Formosa in Taiwan. The second is the history of the pre-contact contact Taukas. The Taukas are a Formosan people. And the third part is uh, the Qing Dynasty history of the Taukas. Um, we will see here uh, a linguistic map of Taiwan, and I'm going to use that linguistic map of Taiwan uh, to discuss the archeological and linguistic prehistory of Taiwan. But before I do that, I want to talk about uh, two views on the extension of the southern frontier of the Chinese empire. Uh, first, James Scott, uh, The Art of Not Being Governed, an anarchist history of upland Southeast Asia. He basically talks about beyond the frontier and the resistance to the encroaching Chinese empire, the state. And his basic theory is psychological insofar he feels that humans uh, intrinsically uh, don't like the state. And uh, that gives us one perspective because it is related to the political and economic notion of um, self-interest. The second person is Mark Elvin in The Retreat of the Elephants, an environmental history of China. He's basically within the frontier and uh, talking about how the Chinese empire sets up its society once the frontier has passed beyond what were, uh, in essence, a conquered people. And what he, his uh, uh, take on this is uh, different from J uh, James Scott insofar as uh, he admits to the fact that there uh, is um, uh, a self-interest in the economic and the political sense of uh, self-interest, uh, but on the other hand, he believes that there's a so social and cultural logics, if you will, that can be uh, examined independently of the psychological processes. Uh, this is a common uh, uh, way of dividing up the world, uh, but uh, in general, um, Mark Elvin, his most important point is that a uh, non-extractive um, way of life is replaced by an extractive way of life. And he, uh, if I recall correctly, even labels it Chinese style capitalism. Now, uh, I want to turn to that map I had just shown, uh, which is of Taiwan. And the point of the map is to talk about uh, the Austronesian prehistor prehistorical interactions, both within and outside of Taiwan. Uh, uh, that takes us back, way back in history, uh, to the ice age, ages when the uh, um, uh, uh, oceans of the earth uh, were uh, 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 lower, and Taiwan and mainland China were connected by a land bridge. So at the beginning, we must assume, and there is some limited archaeological evidence of early human habitation in Taiwan. Hmm. Uh, maybe 10,000 years ago. Uh, fast forward, however, uh, these people uh, were not the current Austronesian 
occupants of Taiwan. The current Austronesian occupants of Taiwan uh, uh, are uh, the Formosans. They speak a Formosan uh, a group of languages, uh, and uh, they are Austronesian, but also you have the Malayo Polynesians who uh, are related because they're both uh, Austronesians, but in terms of the origin of the um, Formosan population in Taiwan, there's some controversy. It's very possible that uh, they came direct, well, we know they came directly from Southeast mainland China. The Malayo Polynesians, there's a little bit of controversy. Maybe Southeast Asia, maybe Southeast China. Well, the point here is to talk about uh, the archaeology first. And the archaeology is pretty straightforward. There was an enormous range of interactions uh, between Formosa and mainland China and uh, Taiwan and mainland China and also Taiwan and uh, the uh, Pacific region. Uh, this is an important subject because um, it indicates uh, a interaction sphere, if you will, of enormous size. Now, uh, I want to very briefly point out three patterns of lang foremost in language dispersal uh, in Taiwan, because uh, it's of interest because of this interaction. In Taiwan, you have three uh, patterns of dispersal of uh, the uh, Formosan languages. The first place of dispersal starts in southwest ta uh, Taiwan, swings around up the east coast of Taiwan uh, to northeast Taiwan, and then swings over the tip of Taiwan to uh, northwest Taiwan. That's dispersal pattern number one. Number two is uh, on the uh, west coast of Taiwan between northwest Taiwan and southwest Taiwan. And that was a north and south dispersal. The third one is in the mountains. And uh, those uh, Austronesian peoples did not disperse very much. So what we have is three intensities of dispersal. The first is high intensity of dispersal uh, along the Pacific side of Taiwan. The second was a moderate uh, range of dispersal on the west side of Taiwan, and then a low range of dispersal in uh, um, uh, the mountainous region of Taiwan. Now, uh, we have to talk about uh, uh, the Chinese Empire. We don't have much time, but very briefly, I want to point out that from the time when the frontier of the Chinese Empire moved south in the Chinese mainland and passed by Taiwan with ever, without ever coming over in Taiwan. Once that empire moved south, the interactions between Taiwan and mainland China, the Formosan or Austronesian interactions ceased. There was a chill in the cross-straits relationship between mainland China and Taiwan. I think that's important and it endured until the Qing Dynasty, which is uh, 1684 in Taiwan. So um, we have to ask the question, why the chill? Well, there are two answers to it. One answer is there was nothing in Taiwan for uh, the Chinese Empire. Uh, in their eyes, it, it had uh, no resources or trade or anything else that they wanted. The other side of the uh, picture is that uh, in, it's possible that Formosa in Taiwan was, in, uh, was resisting the possible encroachment of the Chinese Empire, and so they developed a society to, to resist it. The only problem is they really had no contact with the Chinese Empire, so it's shadow boxing. Well, uh, it, in terms of that, we move on to basically the second uh, section of this paper, which is uh, about uh, the pre-contact period of uh, the uh, uh, Taukas. The Taukas, an Austronesian people, located uh, on the uh, north central portion of the west coast of Taiwan. And uh, uh, they are related to that group I just mentioned, 
who were on the west coast, some of them moved north, including the Taukas, and some moved south, uh, such as the Hanya. Now, um, the Taiwan at that time was not a part of the Chinese empire. It also was not a part of the world system. They had trade uh, out into the Pacific. They no longer had tr trade with mainland China, uh, but uh, uh, at one point you had an expansion of uh, Chinese traders, uh, pirates, and fishermen uh, across the Taiwan Strait into the vicinity of Taiwan. And when that happened, uh, they began to have a uh, little, a few people living in Taiwan. At tops, uh, during this pe period, there might have been uh, 1,500 uh, Chinese uh, resident there. Uh, many of them became interpreters, uh, and through their interpretations began to uh, do trade with the Austronesians in Taiwan. Uh, they did so by taking the high value end products that Formosans were lacking. That was salt and um, uh, um, metal, iron. They made some iron of their own, and they made really bad salt out of rocks. And so when they had the opportunity to buy high quality salt and uh, 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 a large supply of iron, they jumped at it. And they did so by uh, selling to the Chinese deer hides. These uh, deer hides uh, in Taiwan are very, very, at that time were very, very, um, the supply was enormous. They had sometimes flocks, or not flocks, herds of uh, deer that were perhaps uh, up to 2,000 or 3,000. And so there was a huge supply in, at that time of deer hides to do trading. Now, okay, now uh, I am out of time. Uh, well, uh, the major part of this paper is concerned with how the landscape in Taiwan went from a uh, Formosan landscape into a Chinese, a uh, Qing Dynasty bureaucratic landscape. And it's all connected with mountains and rivers. Uh, in uh, the major mountains and the major rivers, you had one pattern where there was a concentration on sea trade. On the other pattern, small mountains and small rivers uh, it was in the center of, of the Daokas region. Uh, they had a smaller uh, uh, situation, but a more intense situation because it was highly bureaucrat bureaucratized. There were twin pairs. Uh, on the one hand, you had the Chinese and the, uh, and the Formosans who were classed as, as ethnic groups bureaucratically. They had different legal statuses. In contrast to that, there was a second pair. The second pair was uh, all Austronesian who were divided into two groups. The first group are the people who gave the Chinese land and they were still Austri Austro uh, Formosans and they didn't have to do anything in particular except for pay. Uh, they were given rice support stipends. The other group were called a military colony and they had not given land and they were charged with looking over, surveilling uh, the other Austronesians. So what we have among the Taukas is a rule by uh, uh, Formosans, using the Formosans to control the Formosans and using the Chinese to monitor all the Formosans. If I might have one concluding sentence here, there's an ontological and an epistemological, uh, not epistemological, ontological and existential issue here as knowing subjects. Because at the beginning, uh, Formosan Austronesians, uh, for, Formosans were headhunters and raiders, and it was a, an island of, of violence. And uh, when the Han Chinese arrived, it was possible that your head would be taken. Now that's what I call an exist existential moment. And as a knowing subject, it's really not interior to you. It is extramental. The final one is that uh, a more ontological moment because the Formosans in running their bureaucracy were charged with disciplining their own people 
on behalf of the Chinese. Um, sorry I ran over time. Uh, we're done. Thank, Thank you. you, Jason. We keep a brisk pace here. So Lisa Palmer will speak on the flow of time, space, reconfiguring, a la reconfiguring landscape through water in East Timor. Thank you. And I'll just okay. grab that pointer. The clicker, yes. Yeah. Great, so hi everyone. Um, thank you very much to the panel organizers, Fred and uh, Steve, for inviting me to speak today. And thank you also in advance to uh, Joel, our discussant, who uh, I'm looking forward to hearing from soon. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing where this panel uh, and the watery journeys that we're gonna be talking about is going to, to take us over the next uh, couple of sessions. Um, although there are a lot of historical implications that can be drawn from what I'm about to present to you, I should preface my presentation in the fact that this presentation is very much grounded in my own present day ethnography in Timor-Leste. So to the flow of time space, reconfiguring landscape through water in Timor-Leste. In this presentation, I want to show how physical landscapes, in this case, a karstic spring system, can be used as a foundational metaphor to flesh out complex and partially overlapping scientific and indigenous accounts of contingency and emergence through, between, and across the time-space continuum. I focus here on indigenous ethno-geomorphology and deep historical ecology, to borrow a term from Fred, of a karstic landscape in Timor-Leste. I reflect on the ways in which this landscape has been brought into being and continues to become through the Holocene. Then by drawing out the indigenous processes and practices, I explore in more detail this indigenous landscape and show both its dynamic and emergent properties and the interactivity of its component parts across a socially complex time-space continuum. So first to the geographical subject of my presentation. Timor-Leste, many of you will be familiar with its background and status as a post-conflict nation. Indeed, some call it a fragile state. I won't be dwelling on this today, suffice to say it's poor, it has issues, not the least of which is the onslaught of technocratic environmental governance regimes which arrived along with democracy post-independence, and that was in 2002. While a key component of this enterprise has been the introduction of best practice state regimes of social and environmental governance, as in other parts of the world, these measures often suffer from a critical blind spot. They overlook the rights, interests and traditional entitlements of constituent customary communities and thereby fail to consider how their pre-existing bodies of knowledge, institutions and praxis may contribute to local and regional governance regimes. So I've worked here over the past 13 years. During the Indonesian occupation from 1975 to 1999, when Timor was closed to outsiders, not much anthropological or geographical work was done at all, or indeed archaeological, creating what some have called the ethnographic gap. The landscape is characterized by a very mountainous and contorted terrain along the island spine, lending visual par parallel to the well-known legend of, in which Timor is created from the body of a crocodile. I spoke about the ethnographic gap, but can also talk about the geological gap, as this terrain now offers a treasure trove of insights for contemporary geologists. It was a place not mapped since the 1960s with Audley Charles. Its rich karstic environment is also of great interest to hydrogeomorphologists. This is a map of the hydrogeomorphology of the region. It shows the above and underground water flows and catchments, especially in the plateau region of the Balkal subdistrict at an elevation of around 600 metres. The map is based on joint Timorese Australian government research carried out over the last decade or so, also involving a large investment of funds. Now my research was carried out for much less over the same period. The map, as we would expect, reflects scientific understandings of the geology and the hydro hydrological cycle, describing the natural catchments and geological barriers to water flows across the zone. In contrast, I am interested in social catchments and how these social groundwater flows transcend naturalized boundaries. 
I argue that these intensely socialised flows are linked as well to community wellbeing and that these social catchments raise questions about the scale at which resources are governed and what boundary making processes can be considered admissible and by whom. So I've been interested in people's social and cultural connections through and understandings of water across the region. What in the literature is referred to as the hydrosocial or more specifically the hydrocosmological cycle. This photo is taken at Waikinari Spring to the east of Baokao town, meaning in the local Waimaa language, the water of the original people, referring to the people who are said to have emerged from the depths of the earth and the associated world of the sea through this and other spring portals. This is the Irabi Spring in Watakarabao on Timor's south coast. This is also a place of big water stories. Irabi means potent water in Makasai and the current living human custodians assert an unbroken connection through time with the ancestral beings associated with the spring. But it is not only their connection to this spring which is important, but their connection forged through this water to other peoples across the landscape, peoples whose communities were established when they moved out and planted the spring water from Irabi into other locations, sometimes as far away as the north coast. Following the narratives of these watery connections, ancestral trails and spirit beings moving through, between and across this time-space continuum from the mountains to the sea and indeed back again, has enabled me to follow as well the migrations and intermingling of people, their houses and languages. From these narratives of people's connections to and movements through water, I have been able to map complex cultural taxonomies of interspecies connection particularly those between people and water-associated species such as eels and pythons. These taxonomies form the basis of what I call an inclusive sociality, a concept of being wherein the social always includes the more than human, creating a meshwork of time and space which constitutes a range of social relationships between people, animals, objects and places, as well as the spirit world. In this understanding of landscape, all these diverse beings are understood as alive and in constant communication and participation with each other. So during this research, I participated as well in much ritual activity at Springs. Springs are understood as key portals to other worlds. These rituals seek ancestral blessing for human and agricultural fertility. Particular springs are always linked to particular ancestral origin houses, which are often the founding, house, founding houses of communities. So my starting point for this research was the major spring of Wailea in Baokao. I don't have a pointer, but it's at number 13, uh, 9 there on the slide. A spring whose source is said to be a, dis a, dis a distant underground water source on the arid Baokao Plateau, a cave called Wailea Bere, who is there in, on number one. These water sources are connected to each other in an important regional narrative where a man is said to have traveled through the water underground from the plateau emerging in Baokao's Wailea Spring where he married a local woman and so created the ongoing ritual relationship between these dry and wetland communities. The flow of this spring and today's the Baokao town's water supply is said to be dependent on the ongoing ritual relationship between these communities. This map shows the local understandings of the groundwater flow across the plateau. You can see it going in five underground directions from the parent source in Wai at Wailea Bere. It is different to the scientist's mapping, which shows Wailea Bere only flowing northeast to Wailili, which is the, the channel on the far right of the slide, your far right. However, ongoing hydrogeological research is also coming to understand Baokao's cast aquifer as much more complicated than first thought, both across both space, time and space. Indeed, this movement is also socially complicated. The Wailili Spring Complex, shown here, features prominently in earlier iterations of the ritual and political connections between peoples of the wet and dry zones. This is in a period before the narrative connection between Wailea and Wailea Berry became preeminent, perhaps as a result of the location of the new Portuguese town. This is the ancestral origin house, Ledetame Ikun, which has custodianship over the Wailea Berry cave and water source on the dry lands in the plateau. These two ritual leaders were key informants of this research, although both have now passed away. 
One of, here is one of these men, Major Koraku. He's pictured in full ritual regala. As I tried to understand people's connections to water in the region, Major Koraku shared with me many seemingly cryptic origin and migration narratives, narratives of language interaction and cultural exchange, narratives, narratives which, as I came to see much later, were all mediated through deep and complex metaphysical understandings of time, water, and fire, and the way these elements connect people to people, people to their environment, and people to the ancestral realm. At the same time, these narratives resonated uncannily with what little is known about the region through the historical, linguistic, and archaeological record, a record which suggests both movements to Timor out of, from out of China and from other non-Austronesian-speaking places. But more importantly, these oral histories put flesh on the bones of this record, however, par however partial, incomplete, or dynamic they might be. These oral histories are still alive. They still matter for people's sense of themselves, for their interrelations between communities, and how this organises rights, interests, and the management of their lands and waters. These narratives are also linked in with the workings of the traditional irrigation cooperatives, a set of people known as the Kabul Bay the community water controllers of the spring-fed irrigation channels running from the marine terrace zone down to the sea. Irrigated rice is possibly very old, asserted to be pre-colonial in this zone. Local oral histories tell of the arrival of rice cultures, the founding of new houses and springs, and the activation of irrigation practices at particular springs. The irrigation practices in this slide are linked to the ritual practices which connect Wailea's flow with the Wailea parent water on the plateau. One of the functions of these rituals is to ensure the plateau's dryland farmers receive tributes of rice annually in exchange for them enabling the flow of water down to the rice fields. This is the Wailea Spring today in Balcao town where a Portuguese-built pump station was established in the 1960s. The structure in the foreground of this photo is the grave of the founder of Balcao's origin communities. Yet despite the significance of this spring to people's understandings of water custodianship, use and negotiation, since the independence era, the Timorese government has never really engaged with the ritual significance of the spring to the local community. While since the Indonesian withdrawal, community-wide rituals at springs are slowly re-emerging, it is also the case that these complicated, highly sequenced undertakings and events require the negotiation of many ritual, political and economic components. In the case of Balkal Town, the government presence and control of the Wailea Spring complicates this even further. In contrast, the smaller origin house rituals carried out at springs, events which are tied in with annual raise, rice and maize harvests, are relatively less complicated to carry out. However, the material structures of many of these houses were burnt down during the Indonesian occupation, and this has hindered these ritual activities, just as the political situation meant that larger scale community ritual activities were severely curtailed. In the independence era, as people prioritised these ancestral origin house reconstructions, associated resurgent house-based economies of exchange and obligation continued to gather momentum across the district. Only time will tell to what extent these practices are engaged by the current technocratic water governance orthodoxy, an orthodoxy which relies largely on universal science for its interventions in hydrological matters. Yet the watery narratives I have documented over more than a decade in this landscape teach us a lot about the migration histories and people's connections to this place and each other. They also signal the possibilities for re-emerging practices and negotiations around contemporary water custodianship in Timor-Leste, even in the context of cities. As a result, it is my argument that there is a pressing need, obligation even, for researchers to work together across the presumed divide of scientific and indigenous landscape epistemologies. As we have seen, the latter, as well as the former, focus on causal interactions and complex understandings of landscape contingency and emergence across a time-space continuum. It seems to me that there is much to be negotiated. Thank you. Damon will speak on his own uh, paper this time. 
Okay, this paper uh, began with the title of Stone and Water to Soils and Starch Horticultural Transformations During the Holocene Settlement of the Pacific. We, uh, I wrote this, co-wrote this with Simon Bickler, who's done archaeology in both uh, the Coolering and Muyu, uh, the northeast corner of the Coolering, and in um, uh, New Zealand. And this presentation discusses landscape transformations evident from ethnographic and archaeological research um, uh, in the Coolering and in New Zealand. And I would like to say is that some years ago, um, Eric Swimmer told me about complaining to Levi Strauss that it was absurd that he could turn an Orakaiban myth, which is uh, almost in the highlands in Papua New Guinea, into a Maori myth that he was also studying. And Levi Strauss said, remember the Mesim. And the Mesim is one of the names for the um, uh, the cooler ring, and, and he was referring to the fact that the Masim is obviously part of an Austronesian uh, uh, culture, which Orakaiba is not particularly, uh, but in that sense uh, uh, close to perhaps New, uh, New Zealand. Now, current archaeological understandings suggest these areas are both late chapters in the Austronesian expansion from what uh, archaeologists refer to as near to remote Oceania. And I believe that these patterns are evident in a, a, a chapter of human history that is continuous with things in China. These include massive landscape alterations consistent with culturally defined needs adapted to local conditions, as well as attempts to make the earth conform to images in the sky. Uh, the human occupation of Australia and parts of New Guinea uh, would seem to prece um, uh, predate this, and there is some evidence of, if you will, that order of human history inside the cooler ring, uh, but um, not a lot. And 18,000 years ago, you could walk to the Torbrind Islands. These are the places we are looking at. Jeff Irwin gave me the, uh, the boat end with the picture of a uh, turtle, and he asked if I could identify it, and I couldn't. But I sent it to one of my Muyu friends, and he immediately told me how it was understood in the, in the Muyu classification of turtles, and he also knew the scientific classification. That turtle is it was, it's on a, 14, uh, a boat from about the 14th century. Now, uh, this is what we are uh, dealing with, um, uh, uh, Muyu. We know that it looks like there was a line of human activity that perhaps passed, uh, Austronesian activity that perhaps passed between New Guinea and Australia, uh, went through the Coolering area and then ended up in the Solomon Islands. That's maybe 2,500, 2,800 years ago. Most archaeology, however, uh, is dealing with the Coolering area inside the last 2,000 years. Uh, and really more uh, appropriately inside the last 1,500 years. And the time between about um, 1,200 and 1,400 of the Common Era is the time when the, the Coolering region probably uh, comes close to assuming uh, the appearance that we had at contact. Um, one of the patterns in the Austronesian world is, is people traveling really far and then concentrating themselves into more local regions, and we, we could say we could see that in the cooler ring. Um, if you will, the first phase of action, uh, of Austronesian action, or what looks like Austronesian action on the northern side of the cooler ring is building megalithic, what we call now megalithic structures and ruins, all over the northern side of the cooler ring. Those are the ones that are charted on Muyu. Uh, those are the ones that you can see in the, your bottom right, Iwa, uh, Kitava, and uh, Kiruina, the Trobrians, they're all over the place. Um, uh, these may be started being built uh, in, from the 5th to the 9th century. Uh, by the uh, 12th to the 14th century, they were no longer being built or used. And it's at that point when uh, one can make an argument, well, also at that point, about 1400 of the Common Era, we begin to find conus shells that have carvings that look like lapida etchings in them. Um, and w one of the, and those are not find, found before about 12, 1400. And the, one of the presumptions is that those things end up in the cooler ring as it is now composed. 
Uh, that is a picture from 1974. On your left, that man also had turned some of those old uh, shells um, into uh, valuables that are circulating at this point in time. Now, um, we became particularly fascinated with the, the megalithic structures and standing stones that are strewn over this thing. They are obviously in um, a land that looks like it's gardening land. And I think that they show structures that are consistent with contemporary aspects of Muyu cosmology and understandings of space. Um, uh, this is one which has a more or less east-west orientation. Uh, the most famous one is up around Kaulai where the red circle is. And uh, this is Simon Bickler's mock-up of it. He was really intrigued by the close to north-south orientations of it. When I first saw it, what my informants did was uh, uh, point out the uh, east-facing sides of the large stones, and then I started looking at uh, alignments um, in that structure and a whole bunch of others in that area. And it was fairly clear, to me at least, that they more or less connected a, a December solstice sunrise to a June solstice sunset. December solstice time is more or less in the center when Muyu people think they should be planting their yams. The June time is kind of in the middle of their harvesting yams. That's not true all over the cooler ring. So these things become very specific uh, in terms of their structures. And the orientations I think I can see in the Muyu megaliths, I cannot find in the Trobrian ones. And that's actually consistent with the fact that the Trobrian spaces are indeed different. Now. Um, this past summer, I returned to the island, and among other things, I was pursuing uh, fantasies about possible relationships between um, the local astronomy and things I'd learned about China, and I was a little bit shocked with what turned up. Um, the, on, the, on your right is a diagram people did in the sand for me of the sky, it's the circle, and the island, the earth, is in the middle. And as some of you know about Chinese cosmology, that's actually a virtual exact replication of how the Chinese understand their, um, their if you will, the relationship between the land and the heavens. Uh, and then what went beyond that is that although I had understood before the orientations in the garden is, is related to the sunrise and sunset, they said, well, that's true, but it's really the swings of the Milky Way more or less during the June solstice um, time period, uh, more or less at early dark, the Milky Way is oriented pretty much east-west. By more or less the same time of the night in December, it's organized sort of uh, northeast to southwest. Now, that northeast to southwest line does not fit the north-south line in Muyu people's gardens. Uh, there is a rectangle, uh, 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 bisecting lines and everything, but they told me that they make that north-south line, uh, they model it after the switching of the um, Milky Way. And this is actually a vital thing. All gardens have structures in them like that, which in addition to uh, being a condition for the productivity of the garden is thought to be a model for marriage relations. Also, it turns out there are important sets of stars that, that organize certain sorts of relationships. These are obviously um, our understandings of Scorpio and Orion's belt. Um, the cross beam that connects a hull to a float is, uh, goes by the same name as the constellation for um, uh, Orion's belt. This is true throughout much of Polynesia. There's this association between that pivotal part and that constellation. And um, uh, every important person, um, usually men, but not necessarily men, is, they're supposed to wear um, these, these big uh, long combs in their hair, and, and that's the same um, uh, term that um, um, Scorpio goes by. And that is a sign of their power. Now, what, what's, what the argument I'm making is that these guys are organizing their world according to the heavens. Now, uh, getting away from that, although I, I could talk about all the facts now in terms of those relationships, but I now want to elaborate the horticultural um, uh, structures they've created. Uh, the picture on the, your upper left is of a, a garden area in the southeastern corner of the island. 
It creates spaces that produce the, uh, the keels for the boats that ply the, the eastern half of the cooler ring. And um, uh, the, the idea is very specific, is that arc is going to end up as the rock of the canoe. Um, there are two trees that grow in the Sulog Mountains, which you see there. Uh, those trees become the um, most appropriate um, uh, mass for this class of boat, and that's known all over the Kulering. The boats will be built in Gawa and Quailat without the appropriate trees, and when they get to Muyu, they're switched, and everybody knows that that should happen. They don't always do it, but they know that the trees in that particular place are the best trees. And then uh, back to that original position, the, the particular fallowing system in southeastern Muyu is designed, among other things, um, to, to produce the planks for the platforms on these boats. And this is the thing, when I was first told this, I said, you've got to be kidding, because I thought all this stuff was sort of happenstance. And they said, no, that, that we have it organized this way. And it turns out is that the, the difference in the fallow systems all across the cooler ring, uh, the north the eastern side of the Kululuin goes into producing um, the boat structures. Now, they also go into producing variations in the crops, but it's easier for me to talk about this synchronization of the landscape to objects in terms of these boats more so than in the case of the um, uh, gardens. Now, the, the switch from um, the cooler ring to New Zealand follows from the fact that the current understanding of the settling of New Zealand is that whatever the particular the initial scouting of the place was, uh, it happened all of a sudden so that there was a mass um, a, a, a population, you know, all of a sudden 500 or more people come from um, uh, uh, more or less the Cook Island area. Uh, the Society Islands and arrive in New Zealand in well-formed boats um, and the presumption is they knew what they were doing, they're part of an organized society. Uh, one of our sources for this has done some uh, genetic work and he's been able to show it's, it was not a random population, it was purposely set, or so it seems to be purposely set up of different kinds of uh, different sets or different sort of genetic m mark groups. So it wasn't a whole bunch of people all of a sudden leaving randomly, it was from here, here and there and sailing. Now, this gets um, interesting because that design, the, the, the image of those, uh, the turtle on the boats, disappears after a while, as uh, uh, does the settlement pattern and the sailing abilities of people in New Zealand. Um, our, our source for this New Zealand material is um, uh, uh, a guy by the name of Walter and his colleagues, and he points out is that this particular place, Waru Bay, was uh, uh, one of the first big sites in which all of a sudden you've seen sort of a, a mass of people going there and settling, and you get distributions all across the whole island, and those people maintain their connections back to um, uh, um, the, the central islands. So let me go back here. Can I reverse this somehow? Uh, yes. The other place where we have some archaeological data is from Auckland. Now, it, it may just be a matter of our current research, um, but this place in Auckland, it looks like it doesn't really get settled and become a significant second uh, centralizing place until two or three hundred years after the uh, place in Wari Bar. And by that time, the settlement around uh, 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 Warai ba, ba is sort of, uh, not dis disintegrated is the wrong word, but people no longer live on that coastal spot and they've moved inland and they're into more kinds of, of agriculture. So that the, the New Zealand area becomes in a sense uh, its own system somewhat separated from elsewhere. Now I was anxious for um, uh, uh, my archaeological associate Simon Bickler to be able to tell me that there were or orientations to the stars and the sun and all that here. He isn't interested in that, but I finally convinced him, well, we're there. And he said, yes, there is evidence for that. And it's known as that m many important um, um, Maori structures had to face east. So, and it's also known as that their star lore, according to uh, Jeff Irwin, is more located with agricultural things than it is with navigation, since they seem to have lost that. So there is some evidence that um, 
the idea of part of New Zealand being formed in relationship to the uh, model of the heavens is there. Two minutes. Okay. We have, uh, this is a sort of a, a synthesizing model. This is the interesting thing here. We can, we can say is that Sago yams and taro is the central thing in, in the Kula ring. Uh, it's breadfruit, taro, and kumara eventually in, in uh, um, the society islands and the cooks, etc. And then when you get to um, New Zealand, it's kumara, uh, which becomes more and more important through time, and taro falls out, and then there is fern root. And, th and it looks like this fern root stuff becomes... Um, almost the equivalent of sago. Now, um, this is an interesting thing about this comparison because uh, Simon Bickler tells me that all the archaeologists know this quantitatively, but hadn't, they hadn't, none of them had sort of thought through this. And by Simon sort of organizing this comparison, he's brought some data together in which obviously needs more serious uh, consideration. Also, the thing, things is the, 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 the boats and the canoes in New Zealand uh, change a lot. Now, I don't have time to go through um, all of Simon's data, but this, these are uh, talks about his sites in the Auckland area that he's looking at, uh, and he's got some descriptions of the kinds of things they're finding. Most of the dates here are from um, uh, the 15th century and after, and you do begin to see people making alignments uh, over territories that they've already worked considerably, uh, but he hasn't paid a whole lot of attention to calendrical stuff. Uh, this is the Wetty area, which is sort of the northern part of um, uh, the Auckland area. The whole Auckland area is, is a convenient central place because it's easy to go from to the Pacific to the Australian side of the island and therefore get all of it. This is the chronology uh, and again in this particular area it really looks like it gets more intense a couple of years, hundred years after the initial uh, settling of um, New Zealand. Uh, and here's his discussion of trees, and there is uh, some evidence of serious trenching and manipulation of water for taro. Uh, he's a little bit mystified in that particular area uh, about um, Kumar, but in, in, given his data, it looks like it was grown uh, closer to the beaches than elsewhere, and he can construct this model for the variation of the landscapes. Uh, okay. Here are the phase transformations again, and I want to add, this is a shot I took from uh, uh, Fujian province uh, in uh, 2013, I believe, and the thing that struck me is that the staked yams and the taro are around the edges of the rice, and I think as you get into the Melanesian part, you see, um, in some sense, sago replaces rice. And, uh, and becomes a kind of edge phenomena, and at least in some places, and the other foods take over. Uh, I wanted to ask, I wanted to get Simon to tell me about trees, and uh, he didn't care and doesn't know anything, so I, I had to kind of punt there. But then I remembered um, an important text from Solon's. Uh, when he's going over, the, you know, where is the how, and it's, you know, the how of the forest is actually pretty important to that famous understanding. And then there was the question, does this relate to China at all? And when I first went to, the uh, into China and I asked people, are trees important? They said, no, they're not particularly important in China. And then I discovered this, uh, two of the main ways that China organizes its large and encompassing notions of time have to do with the structure of a tree. I found some of it a little bit baffling and asked a friend, how does that work? And she drew it like this, the tree's upside down. And to me, this is hearkening to some of the inversions that were central to um, the argument that um, David Jabot was trying to make. Thank you very much. Welcome, Francis Morphy uh, and Howard Morphy, who will speak on remaking the coast and retaining the names, continuities, and discontinuities along the East Arnhem Land Coast. Okay. Thank you, first of all, Fred and Steve, for organizing the session, and to Joel in advance for your summary. In recent times, uh, we, that is Howard and I, have created a database of toponyms that covers a large portion of Yolngu country in northeast Arnhem Land. Now, which one do I press? Uh, the large green one pointed that way. Ah, there we go. That's Yolngu country 
inside the dotted line. In this paper, we're going to look at a distinctive subset of these names, 69 so far known, that share a common final element, chbi, inside that red circle there is where they're found. Um, this can be roughly glossed as place of, although in today's language it's not recognised as such. We'll not focus in detail here for some reasons of time on their linguistic history, uh, which is the subject of a longer paper in preparation with the archaeologist Pat Faulkner, whose data we rely on quite heavily in this paper as well. We'll just say that our analysis so far suggests pretty conclusively that these are very old Yolngu names. The closely related Yolngu Mata languages are an enclave there you go, of the widespread Pamanyungan language family, surrounded on the landward side by non pamanyungan languages, which were much more ancient, um, and to the seaward by the waters of the Arafura Sea and the Gulf of Carpentaria. It's currently thought that proto pamanyungan was spoken around 6,000 years ago, and that it originated near the southwest coast of the Gulf of Carpentaria, which is that big bite out of uh, the top of Australia. Its origin coincides roughly with the time when the Holocene High Stand occurred in this area after the flooding of the Carpentarian Plain, a process that began around 19,000 BP with the post-glacial sea level rise. The former inhabitants of the plain, who would have numbered in the tens of thousands at least, possibly hundreds of thousands, would have been gradually forced higher onto ground, onto the, 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 the land masses that were becoming um, Australia and Papua New Guinea. They would have been grappling simultaneously with significant changes in faunal and floral resources. It's highly likely that the emergence of proto palman Jungen is linked to these events, although nobody's quite proved that connection yet. This language family then spread to cover most of the Australian continent, much in the manner of Indo-European in, uh, in Europe and Asia. Its earliest branching was into three subgroups, Parman, which is the languages of the Cape York Peninsula, to the east, Warawarik to the south of the Gulf, and Nyungik, a western spreading group. And the current hypothesis is, is that Yolngomata is most closely related to the Warawarik languages, and that the ancestors of the Yolngom migrated north along the coast of the Gulf, reaching their present location about 3,000 years ago, and that they were subsequently isolated from the rest of the language family by the eastward movement of speakers of non palmanyungan languages. Thanks to Patrick Faulkner's research, we have very detailed archaeological data for the Point Blaine Peninsula, which was the subject of his PhD research. The Point Blaine Peninsula is, is, in, the, is in the dotted rectangle on the, the map on the left-hand side. And this is part of the area of northern Blue Mud Bay, circled in red, where the um, majority of the known Chpi place names occur. They're found along a restricted area of the coast in the clan estates of speakers of eastern Yolngomata dialects from the Doala and Doal dialect groups, forming a connubium of intermarrying clans. They are known collectively as Jalkri Buingo, a term we will return to later. Pat Faulkner's work on the peninsula shows that although the coastline reached its highest stand at around 6,000 BP, the earliest evidence for regular coastal occupation in the form of extensive shell mounds and middens begins at around 3,000 BP. Occupation before that time was probably intermittent and has left no recoverable archaeological trace. Once the coastline began to prograde following the high stand, particularly in the estuaries of the local rivers, it created the conditions for the establishment of extensive shellfish beds. As in many parts of Australia, and indeed around the world actually, the economic response appears to have been a focus on shellfish exploitation. 
And in this particular locale, the new economy seems to coincide, we think, with the arrival of a new language, namely proto yongomata On the Point Blaine Peninsula, the Holocene High Stand is marked on the western Grindle Bay side by a low lateritic ridge. That's Grindle Bay there which would have formed a cliff overlooking the shallow embayment at the mouth of the Durabudby River. Today, this former bay holds an extensive complex, as you can see, of wetlands nearest to the high stand shoreline and salt flats fringed at the present-day coastline by mangrove-lined creeks. The mounds and middens in this area that were surveyed and excavated are found in the main along the top of the lateritic ridge. This figure shows all the sites that Pat investigated and indicates those for which radiocarbon dates were obtained. We'll focus here on the subset of 28 toponyms that we mapped using GPS. They comprise 41% of the total so far known. These mapped GP toponyms occur almost without exception on the old Holocene High Stand coastline, as you can see, which is the, the white. of Grindle and Mwaiula Bays. On the Grindle Bay side, where there's been considerable progradation, all but one are found on or just inland from the Holocene clifftop. On the Mwaiula Bay side, there have been several phases of beach ridge formation, but the effects of coastal progradation have been much less dramatic. And here the place names are found close to the present day coastline. Six of the toponyms are associated with excavated air sites on the Point Blaine Peninsula, with dates ranging from nearly 3000 BP to close to the present. And it's notable that two, Gumorianutpi and Dilmitpi, are associated with large early mound and midden complexes. So the close association of these names with the Holocene High Stand is either an extraordinary coincidence or an indication that they date at least to the time when this coast became the focus of intensive shellfish exploitation by incoming Yongamata speakers around 3,000 years ago. A little linguistic taster that I couldn't resist concerning the toponym uh, Gumorianipi. This seems to describe a characteristic of the place as it was 3,000 years ago. It is analyzable as Gumor, which means shore or chest, Yarno, which means gully, and Chpi, place of. A glance at the topography of the site reveals that here, just south of the, of the excavated site 29, the lateritic ridge is bisected by a gully, just south of Durpuchpi on the other side of the wetland. 3,000 years ago, this ridge was on the coast, overlooking the tidal mudflats, but it's now 10 kilometers inland. In conversation one day about the Yolngu social system under conditions of radical change, a Yolngu man offered this striking summary. <clears throat> On the surface, Yolngu move around, sometimes marry the wrong way. There seems to be no pattern. But the country holds its eternal pattern from the Wangar, and that always pulls us back. <clears throat> It's worth reflecting on this. We will link this Yongo model to our own analysis of the structural properties of the Yongo system of kinship and social organization and its potential to endure and perhaps expand in its reach. The existence of names in place for 3,000 years requires both a model of oral mode of oral transmission and an imperative for them to, to remain current over time. Names are a central component of the Yong system of knowledge that connects the present to the ancestral past, or Wangar. Naming was an integral to the process of world creation, and the Wangar beings traveled across country, naming the species they encountered, while transforming the shape of the country through their actions. For example, the ancestral stingray Lulomo was speared in Mayula Bay and tore inland, biting the land as he traveled before returning to the sea. His journey is marked by a rocky reef that extends out from the shore, 
which is a transformation of his tail, and by bite marks still visible in the ground as water holes that provide fresh water. Places are often named after aspects of the ancestral events that occurred there, and those events are passed on in the song cycles that recount them. In singing songs, people are singing sequences of place names and their associated narratives. The ancestral world was and is transformational, but names become fixed in place and are manifest in enduring connections between people and place. Place names are markers of the clan ownership of estates, and together with paintings, songs, dances, and sacred objects that are the basis upon which rights and relationships are established. The Ongan belief is that the pattern of ownership set in the Wangar has continued to this day. They acknowledge that over time groups die out, and indeed they have mechanisms for succession to place. The groups who succeed do so by occupying a previously existing and unchanging ancestral space. The Jung asymmetric system of marriage, in which a man marries his classificatory matrilateral cross cousin, um, his mother-in-law is his mother's mother's brother's daughter, is bestowed upon him by his mother's mother's brother. A woman marries a man belonging to a different clan from her mother, that of her mother. As a consequence, the Jungle system of marriage and bestowal requires a minimum of six patrilineal groups to complete a cycle of exchange. The notion of cycles of exchange is not simply theoretical, but the basis upon which the Jungle groups see themselves as being related over time. Jungle clans form regional conumia in which sets of clans are acknowledged to have had long-term relationships of intermarriage. These Kanyubi are not entirely separate, but form overlapping networks that extend across Yorongo country. While as toponyms, names are firmly located in place, as names for people, the very same names can travel widely. They are inherited by people with Kanyubi connections to place. Men are most likely to be named after a place in their own clan country, but will frequently also be given names by their mother's mother's brothers from the clan of their maternal grandmother. Names cycle in a systematic way down the generations, confirming the links between people and places and signaling the rights and responsibilities that people have with respect to country and each other. So as personal names, toponyms can travel far from their place. There's a dialogical relationship between the specificity of names as toponyms and their spread as people's na names and as song words. Individuals have a personal identity with particular places, but so too do the social groups that hold and perform the songs associated with Wangar events. Those songs are performed in ceremonies that sometimes bring people together from across the region as a whole. The songs and the names they contain are thus being maintained both in place and in the wider domain of cultural memory. So it seems really that the present system of social organization and of naming people and places is indeed perfectly compatible with the transmission of such names over 3,000 years if we assume that this system of social organization hasn't changed all that much during that time. The majority of Chpi place names have so far eluded semantic analysis, which is hardly surprising given their likely antiquity. But of the ones we've been able to analyze, four hint tantalizingly at continuities in mythological associations over time. I'll just mention two briefly here. Ancestral snakes are very old. They're almost ubiquitous in Australia. For a subset of Yolngo clans of, the, of this region, Wittich, Olive Python, is a foundational Wangar being who traveled widely through the, their lands. One of the place names, these Chpi place names associated with Wittich, Buko Chpi, can be analyzed as forehead place. Today's Yolngo believe that Buko Chpi is where Wittich tried to stand up, but he was too short. So, Buko Chpi possibly references his head as he struggles to stand there. We've already seen that in the local topography of Madarpa clan country around Mayula Bay was formed by the Wangar Lolomu stingray. 
there is a huge ground sculpture depicting Lolomo near a place called Malitpi, which means shadow or reflection place. Could it be that this Mali has been carefully curated for over 3,000 years? If these toponyms still carry their original Wangar associations, <clears throat> then we have evidence that Yongo cosmology as it is today was substantially in place 3,000 years ago. The Yongo dialects spoken today by the Jalkiri Puyngo clans are, show fewer innovative features than those spoken inland and to the north. The presence of Chpi as a possible remnant of a proto yongo language in just this region suggests it, that it may indeed be where the Yongo first established themselves on the coast and from whence the particular Yongo system of social organization with overlapping connubia pushing out through intermarriage hints at a possible process of expansion to the west. This research has been carried out in close collaboration with Yongo. Our findings do not surprise Yongo in the way that they tend to surprise many non-Yongo who carry with them a model of a world in a constant state of change. However, we're not thereby arguing that Yongo oral history brings with it narratives that are precisely equivalent to our findings. Yongo believe they have been present in place since the beginning of human time. Our claims are more modest. Our methodology is interdisciplinary, com combining anthropological, archaeological, and linguistic analysis. The research shows how much it is possible to learn from a small body of evidence, 69 names, in the context of an increasingly detailed body of anthropological, linguistic, and archaeological knowledge of a regional system over time. very much. Uh, we'll now hear from Joel Gunn, our discussant, as we revel in the spirit of Durkheim. Well, in a way, I wish I was still as ignorant of this as I was a month ago, because that way I wouldn't be struggling with what I'm going to do with 15 minutes. <laughs> The, uh, there are a couple of things that uh, came out of these papers that really just jumps out at me. Uh, one of them is that the uh, work that Lisa and Francis are doing are tapping into the oral traditions that back up a lot of things and, and probably anthropology and certainly history has left a lot of information on the table just because of Western ethnocentrism and thinking that, that these uh, things are not, not worth looking at, but thanks to an obscure place called uh, Culloden and uh, uh, Lisa and I'm sure many other, Francis, many other people, I, I hope that a lot of this is going on. And the other thing that jumped out at me is that uh, was out of uh, Fred's work in Muyu in which he's spliced together this, this idea of landscape seascape which arises out of uh, think, you know, thinking cross, cross technologically about gardens and boats and how to put them together and everything. And not only that, but how to navigate the stars and how to educate your children to navigate the stars with string games. And, uh, and my goodness, lessons that we can certainly learn there. Well, I had to make a map because I couldn't figure out where all these people were coming from. This is, this is the basics of it. And, uh, and uh, really, uh, I was, I'm really impressed that the Austronesians are able to, to settle themselves across 22,000 kilometers of ocean. And uh, also, I'm very curious about how this all fits together in terms of, of the, the languages, the, the uh, uh, material that uh, Francis and, and Howard put together have shown 
I, th I think, and uh, Francis has confirmed this to some extent, that there's just a huge gap between the Austronesians and, and the uh, Australians, and I'm curious about that, and how, you know, how long ago those, those uh, languages separated and that sort of thing. Well, how to look at this, there's all kinds of possible things, you know, complex adaptive systems, gender and kinship and so on. But one thing that, uh, that this is kind of helpful to me in, in terms of thinking about what, uh, I've, I've been working with an organization called IHOPE, which stands for some unmemorable uh, thing like integrated history and future of people on earth and stuff like that. But anyway, it's uh, basically a worldwide uh, research organization in the Maya. And for the group that I'm working with, the Maya Lowlands, and, it kind of, and the, the motto is past informing the future. And uh, something that strikes me about the Austronesian settlement system is that it's what I'm going to call islandized. And I have a friend named John Day who he and his friends uh, got together and studied oil and how much of a supply and, you know, and he th they, they did a lot of calculations and they think that oil is going to be uh, pretty much no longer an affordable commodity by the, the middle of this century and that's going to overthrow that's essentially going to isolate what are now huge population centers into probably somewhat smaller islands. And so in our own future, we have islandization. And maybe we can learn something about how the, uh, uh, from how the Austronesians adapted to this highly, invariable, highly variable environment with good soils and bad soils and volcanoes and atolls and and all of that sort of thing. So, so I'll try to follow that line of thinking to some extent here. This is just a little bit about my uh, Maya Lowlands experience, which uh, spans uh, much longer, but really has been focused on this issue of the past informing the future for about 10 years now. And uh, really what has come out of that uh, kind of recently is that you have, uh, all of us have some kind of an image of the Maya civilization in our minds, which has its, uh, you know, it built great buildings and things like that. But what the understanding that I have gotten out of it is that it's really, those great buildings and all are a failed experiment in urban planning that the Maya tried and failed because it was not sustainable. And so eventually they went back to a way of living uh, which was living on coasts and close to, uh, to wetlands and uh, doing a lot of arboriculture which re resembles a lot of what Fred presents in his book uh, on how, how the uh, Muyu people uh, survived and everything. So, so there's a lot of cross-referencing across these uh, tropical civilizations that have uh, in common the low-density agrarian-based urbanism. So, what came out of the, uh, uh, this islandization, I think, is the educational system that provides for this navigation by the stars development of uh, 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 technological development of the deep sea, sustainable agroforestry, which all, you know, which seems to be what people arrive at eventually, marine transportation to cut the costs of, of being somewhat civilized. And what you're really headed for in all of this is a, uh, some way of describing how people are going to uh, survive in a in a sustainable fashion. I think that there are uh, John and his friends calculate that there's about one and a half times more people on the earth now than are sustainable. And I heard the other day that there 
in order for the whole world to achieve the uh, standard of living in the, in the, that we have in the United States would require five Earths. So, so we have a, a serious problem, and almost certainly we have islandization in our future. And I haven't read uh, uh, Ms. Blakely's paper yet, but from the abstracts I get, she's using a logic which we'll have to use in order to kind of get above local environments and think about social processes. Something that bothers me about all of this is that we know that anatomically modern humans are moving along the coast of the Indian Ocean uh, before 65,000 years ago, I understand now, because they made it all the way across uh, to Australia at that point, and they had to be able to navigate on the ocean to do that. And uh, I don't, I, of course, I didn't write this down, so I don't know where I got this information, but I have read somewhere that people had already gone something like 100 kilometers or something like that off the east coast of Australia in the 30 to 40,000 years ago. And if anybody knows where I read that, I'd be happy to hear about it. But anyway, certainly it's well established that they were already off the coast of Japan by 30, more than 30,000 years ago. And one of the things I'd like to know is what happened between, say, 25,000 years ago and 10,000 years ago did all the, was that one siege of boating that that went on uh, on the high seas a long time ago and then they got discouraged with it or something and had to reinvent it reinvent it in the first millennium BC or what there's a an idea that's starting to float around called kelp highways which makes all this make a lot of sense that's the blue lines in the lower panel here, and uh, these are arguably the richest uh, ecological uh, habitat in the world, and all people would have had to do is take their little boats uh, uh, around, follow those kelp highways, and they go anywhere and they, wa they wanted to and, and be richly fed on the way. They probably would have been more extensive than that in the Pleistocene. That's a modern map. Well, this is this is me struggling with more information, but uh, what I'm trying to do here is this actually needs to be a 3D graphic. But it, across the top, where you see a timeline, Pleistocene, early Middle Holocene, uh, early and Middle Holocene, and early. Late Holocene, which is like three or four thousand years ago, and then the Late Holocene. And one of the things that I see drawing all of this together is that uh, Francis has people moving into situations on the coast of Australia, and uh, uh, there are people moving out of southern China into. Uh, Taiwan about this time and everything and and what it was is it's a period of global cooling which would have immensely reduced the carrying capacity of of a lot of places and probably there would have been uh, you know this would have been the era of 10,000 states in in southern China or in, I guess in China at large and uh, probably those people got uh, who survived as uh, uh, what was it, um, David, uh, or not David, but um, what, uh, James, what, what was it that, uh, you know, that forced them out into, or uh, into these uh, 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 population isolates in Taiwan? I, I have an idea it was this cold period and uh, probably causing a lot of distress across the whole area, and that's that's the early late Holocene. It's it's a period that uh, Rudiman has uh, involved in the history of the world, where there was global cooling because the Earth was on its way back into another ice age, and lo and behold, humans show up with rice agriculture and cattle and eject a lot of 
methane into the atmosphere and save themselves. Uh, so talk about landscapes. Um, I'm just going through here. What are we short on time? Or? No one's knocking at the door, so please. Okay. The uh, I'm just going to go over each of their papers and try to grab something that uh, that struck me as being important. Uh, and uh, in Francis's paper, uh, you have relationships between people, ancestors, and lands. And so, uh, and uh, the the time depth of this, and the way the geology and the uh, and the oral traditions are tied together, and everything, I all I can say, Francis, is that I am thankful for this because finally, after 40 years in anthropology, the deep Australian kinship systems make sense to me. <laughs> but the uh, one thing I wondered about is that you said they were on top of the lateritic ridge, and uh, as far as I know, laterites are usually associated with with wet conditions, and so I'm wondering if maybe the the uh, uh, laterite might have been formed in the middle Holocene, you know, when it was uh, warmer and probably more tropical, and then that. Uh, your, your people would have been coming in there and settling themselves after a great disruption in, say, around three to 3,000 to 4,000 years ago. And I think that fits with your chronology, doesn't it? Uh, I like this stuff that James has about a fault line still existing between the Austronesians and the uh, um, Taiwanese, and we had a little talk before, and now I'm totally confused, so uh, I have to get with James on that one some more. Uh, the idea that, uh, that I'm really impressed by in Lisa's paper is that people have developed a methodology to go through myths and separate out the drama and the history, and make some kind of historical sense out of it f from which arises the kingdom of Luca. Was, was the kingdom of Luca, was anybody aware, I guess, uh, aware of that? Uh, Western historians, or does that totally come out of the... Uh, uh, they're aware of it, but it's not that it's timed it. Yeah. In Fred's work, <coughs> you get this uh, very interesting thing of people settling islands that are vastly different, with Muyu being not very habitable and others being richly inhabitable. And boy, does this ever cross reference with what's going on elsewhere. Uh, in the Maya lowlands, the, the islands are valleys. Uh, <laughs> In, in Greece, the islands are basically harbors, I guess, or something. Actually, Greece and, and their uh, situation is, is very interesting in terms of, uh, of comparison here. What uh, the pictures that I've assembled here, the one on the left is an onageg uh, outrigger from Muyu. And the picture on the right, these are both just off of uh, Fred's slides. And the other one is uh, a boat that they developed in New Zealand after there was apparently a mass colonization of New Zealand by Austronesian people. And, uh, and then uh, I think in his paper, Fred says, after about 100 years, well, they started developing central places well, in the, in the uh, laws of tropical ecology, uh, you don't really have central places. That, that causes too much of a population aggregation. And in the biologically very active tropical ecology, why it, uh, it's an invitation to disease and, and all manner of trouble. 
Well, guess what? You have these tropical people t taking their departure from, from the tropics and going to the temperate zone, and it takes them about 100 years to figure out how to live in a, in a kind of a standardish uh, temperate zone way. In David's paper, uh, I took this picture out of his presentation because I'm, uh, I really like the idea that, that the, uh, I guess this is my question for, uh, for David is, did, were there pre-Han people there? I mean, this is, this is the, this image being carried forward into the modern age. This is this is there now apparently. They they preserved it all the way through the era of the uh, Red Guard and, and all of that sort of thing, and it's still still there and still preserved. And um, and I'm wondering, did uh, you know the the Han? Did were were they the ones that eventually? Influenced the entrepreneurial brothers to carry uh, rice rice farming off to uh, Timor, or um, the the brothers represent something in there, and are they uh, the people that were there before the Han? Before the Han were advantaged by the late uh, late Holocene uh, drier climates, uh, all that kind of leaves me uh, interested. And also, we have a similar case in the Maya lowlands of people taking advice from people from another climatic zone. Uh, I suppose you all know about Teotihuacan and their effort to overtake the tropical Maya lowlands. And basically, Teotihuacan, they were like, uh, USAID or something going in there to tell the uh, the Maya how to do it, and they set them up for this uh, this architectural experiment where they were going to build where they did build giant cities dependent on seasonal rainfall, and uh, and that I would imagine that the the Maya with all their calendrics and everything were perfectly aware that there's about a 300 year cycle in rainfall there at the end of which you get extended droughts that last 10 years. Uh, in the ninth century, there were three extended droughts of this sort. And, uh, but for some reason, they ignored probably what was their resident knowledge and says, oh, let's be like the Teotihuacanis and build a, a great trading city with, with very good information exchange and everything. And it worked for a while and then uh, it didn't work for a while. So here's looking back, basically what I've said. And looking forward, uh, you have the the uh, islandization thing, a uh, lot of diversity of environments, uh, renewable energy, uh, is there enough in uh, in in solar panels and in windmills to to uh, power our society, or are we uh, uh, you know are we up up against some other kind of problems where we have to release our technology like uh, Sing Chu in his book says happens in dark ages. So. Here's, here's the conclusions that I think that uh, have to do with Austronesia and how it informs the future. One of them is educate your children, which is uh, we've had more than one discussion today already about how we're faltering in our education, at least in the United States, of our children. Adapt your energy needs. Basically, it looks like the Maya were interested in creating a, a society that that had uh, high energy needs and high coherence in the uh, social system, but eventually they figured out how to have a have a a society that has 
highly sophisticated technology, marine technology, because that's where you get your efficient um, transportation. But they had to uh, had to give up uh, some of the uh, the nice accoutrements of pyramids and whatnot to to adapt to that. And all of these are things are saying: take care of your forests. Develop agroforestry. Fred and Chu and, and all of these people are saying, take care of your forests. That's all I have to say. All right, well, thank you very much.